Hi, this is Sam Botstein for TractorSkills.com. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube for all of our tractor tutorials and check us out at TractorSkills.com. In today's tutorial, we're going to take a look at tractor's preferences, and specifically at those preferences which affect what you can see in the software, how it appears. We get a lot of questions here about uh, how to get the waveform to display in the spectrum mode or multicolor mode like I have here, or you know why the software looks a certain way when it does it on their own computer. This should answer all of those questions. In a future tutorial, perhaps in one of our full-length courses at ADSRSounds.com, we'll actually go through every single preference available in Tractor and explain what they mean and how to use them. In this case, we're just going to take a look at the visual stuff. Tractor helps you out in some instances where if there's a preference that affects what you can see, it actually gives you this little eye icon. It doesn't do this for all of the preferences though. So let's go through and look at all the different preferences that'll affect what you can see in the software. Now in these first four, audio setup, output routing, input routing, and MIDI clock, as far as I can tell, there's no preference in there that's gonna affect what you can see. However, in time code setup, there is one hidden away and it's this tracking alert. I usually like to leave this off. What the tracking alert is, is whenever there's anything up with your time code setup, you know, you're moving the record, you're queuing, you stop the record, uh, there's dust under the needle, any of those cases, it'll give you this red flashing warning. Now, as a scratch DJ, I don't particularly like this. Uh, it just adds a lot of distraction and makes things a lot more busy because I'm typically manipulating one or more record at all times, even if I'm just mixing. Uh, if you mix with vinyl, then, you know, obviously you're touching the records all the time and manipulating it, and this tracking alert does not necessarily help you. However, if you, you know, really needed a warning when things weren't tracking just right, if you had dust under the needle, if you really wanted, you could turn on this tracking alert. I personally leave it off. There does not seem to be any sort of visual preference in loading. In transport, there are a couple different things. So there's this tempo control up here. This controls the tempo range that you can see on these pitch faders here. So when you have the tempo range set to 100, you should be able to pitch things up from, let's say, here I have a track loaded that's at 140, I can put it all the way up to 280, or all the way down to zero. When you have the tempo range set to, say, like 2%, it's gonna be much smaller. I only can go, you know, 2% up or down. So I typically like to leave this all the way up at 100, and the reason I leave it that far is because, in general, I'm controlling the tempo or the pitch of the track using the pitch fader on my turntables or you know you could use CDJs or a controller or whatever so typically I would just leave this at a hundred just in case you need to get some sort of extreme change and use your hardware to control that most of the time. There is another one here and it's under mouse control. Now I usually like to leave mouse control on snap. The way that this works is you can jump to different parts of the music and also give a little preview just by clicking where you currently are. This is super, super useful as compared to the vinyl mode, which lets you do this business, which is kind of cool, but it does not actually present a lot of usefulness if you are also using turntables or CDJs or a controller or whatever. So I recommend using Snap and I recommend setting the tempo range to 100%. Under Decks Layout, this is a pretty big one. So uh, the deck flavor, you can choose between track deck, remix deck, and live input. I recommend using two track decks, and then uh, it's really up to you whether you use remix decks or uh, two more track decks or any combination. This deck layout section is a big one. So typically, I use this layout, which we'll look at the layout manager in a second, but in this layout I have everything set to advanced, so you can't really see uh, much in terms of this uh, browser here. You know, I only can see like a couple tracks at a time, but I have much more real estate dedicated to the tracks that are running. You can actually set things to be very small, 
uh, all the way up to essential and then full, which is really between essential, full, and advanced is just a sort of a visual preference. I personally like to look at advanced, but for some people, essential, you know, it does show you a bigger waveform. It's really up to you um, what to do. Of course, A and B move together, so as do C and D, so you can't set these all to be different sizes. You can just choose, um, you know, the different options. I prefer advanced. You can also choose not to show C and D, making you sort of like a two deck setup. Uh, if you're just mixing one track into the other, you know, you're not doing anything fancy with three and four decks, that's, uh, that's you know, absolutely up to you and you can do that. I typically like to use four decks at all times on all of my layouts, so you can show um, A, B, C, and D that way. Now, the tempo fader is pretty straightforward. When you initialize it, it shows you the tempo fader. Uh, you can show the tempo fader or not individually for each deck. It'll let you, you know, pick and choose. Now, the platter scope preference I think is interesting. I typically leave them on minimized or off. Uh, minimized doesn't take up a lot of screen area, and if you're using timecode and, you know, something's up or, you know, you just want to see the platter or the scope, all you have to do is click this little thing and it'll show you. I believe you can actually map this as well. Maybe in a future tutorial I'll show you how to make a there's something wrong with my vinyl setup and you know you can hit this button on your keyboard or controller or whatever and it'll show you all these uh, scopes so you can calibrate everything and see the scope and everything. Uh, the three options are, uh, sorry, the four options are minimized platter which kind of show you, shows you this business which is not particularly useful but kind of cool and the scope, which of course shows you how your uh, vinyl is tracking. Now, the grid mode uh, allows you to move between this kind of look where you have sort of a dim grid. I find this uh, personally really hard to see in the dark in the club when there's like a light show going, so I have it on full most of the time. It doesn't bother me. The ticks are um, very minimal, and of course invisible doesn't show you any kind of grid. I have it set to full, uh, but you know it's it's up to you to choose. The minute markers show up down here. I like to have them on. Uh, pretty much anything that gives me a warning that the track is going to end at some point uh, is something that I'm interested in. So I have the beats to cue set up. I have the well, I mean we'll take a look at that in track decks. But I have all this stuff set up such that I'll know when things are going to end, so I don't you know suddenly have no music playing or you know some sort of complete DJ disaster like that. You also have the option to show cover art. I don't have cover art for most of my tracks. I have a lot of wave files which don't really take tags and cover art so well, so I often will leave this off, but you can turn it on and look at the pretty cover art. The phase meter uh, shows up here. I like to have the phase meter visible because it allows me to uh, not necessarily use beat sync. You might have noticed that in uh, my transport section I had tempo sync set up. If you are going to use sync, I would definitely recommend using tempo sync and not beat sync. If, any, if anything isn't properly gridded or there's sort of anything going on, you can just sort of move the platter or your jog wheel or you know whatever to sort of fix it and you have a visual indicator of what's going on. Uh, so I recommend using tempo sync and as opposed to beat sync and showing the phase meter. Now in track decks, this is where you can configure all of the stuff visible up here. I like to show the title and artist, uh, pretty essential uh, to know what you're playing. And then I like to have comments on. I like beats to queue. This will show you how many uh, beats are between where you are and your next queue. So let's just drop in a queue point. As you can see, as I'm moving backward, it's going to show me how many beats are coming into that queue. So this is potentially very useful if you're doing uh, something where you have a mix out marker, you know, you know how long you have before you're going to mix out. Uh, potentially very useful. I also like to have lots of BPM information. So you have the stable BPM, the track BPM, and the tempo. So you can see uh, exactly what's going on, especially if you're using like hardware turntables that can be uh, kind of important. Again, I like all sorts of warnings about how much of the track is left, so remaining time is useful too, and I like to see the key because I like to mix harmonically. 
Then in the advanced tabs, you can, of course, touch these things as well, but uh, it might be useful to uh, set these up here. Now, in miscellaneous, there's this track end warning. I like it to be set to about 30 seconds, but you can put it all the way up to, you know, two minutes. The play marker position, I like to have it set at 20. I think it defaults to right in the middle at like 50, but I like to have it way over, but uh, I like to see a little bit of what's behind, what's going on so that I can scratch. Um, but again, I like to see as far into the future as possible, so I usually set it to about 20. Um, just to give you an idea of all sorts of things that are possible, if you are a sort of classic hip-hop breaks DJ, and you are all about backspinning, you can actually set this up here so you can just take a quick glance at your computer and see all the stuff behind the play marker. And if you're like me and you like to see what's going on, you can sort of set it up to 20, and in the middle, uh, you know, it's sort of best of both worlds. Very safe to put in the middle. The default zoom is a good one to configure for yourself. I personally wouldn't zoom all the way out like that. I personally wouldn't look at these tiny little waveforms. Somewhere in between is probably right for you. The default at zero is a good choice, but it might be a, also a good choice to zoom out a little bit so you can see more of what's coming ahead. In Remix decks, there's all sorts of things that you can hide. So you can hide this volume fader, you can hide the filter fader. I like to be able to see all of that, especially if there's no sound coming from a cell, I wanna know why. Um, I like to always see these slot indicators so I know what page I'm on. In the mixer, here are things that you can change in your mixer layout. So I like to have multiple layouts where I have a lot of these preferences be different, but here's when you can turn on and off your EQ and fader. Uh, very important. If you're mixing with just the mouse, you probably want to have that. Uh, the filter key gain balance. This is sort of all, all the things that you need to mix. There's also a software crossfader, which you can see. If you're using the Control Z2, it can sort of be fun to watch your crossfader fly back and forth. I typically have all of these offs because I, I use a real hardware mixer um, when, I, when I mix with Tractor. But uh, I have other layouts where those things are all on for tutorials and things like that. Okay, in global settings. There's this really silly one where you can either show the global section or not. You know, maybe you don't need to see any of that. You know, you know you're just working from your hardware, or you're not using the effects or any of the global section. But uh, you also have the ability to switch between these two things on each side. So you can switch between effect one and the master clock and you can switch between effect two and the recorder. These are of course available right there. The tooltips will show up if you hover over something and you have this preference turned on. I personally don't use them, but if you're just trying to um, learn stuff, you can be useful. Show value when over control. When this is off, you're not gonna see the numbers at all when it's on, you're going to see the numbers. I actually like to see the numbers. Uh, when we're mapping stuff for machine in a future tutorial, I'll show you how to view these bars or the numbers. I think it might be nice to be able to just mouse over and see the exact number it's set to. You can have deck header warnings or not. I like to have them. Uh, if you're trying to load up a track and it didn't work or it's not going right or whatever, I'd like to know right away as opposed to trying to go right back to DJing and not be aware of the issue. You can also uh, reset all of the dialog boxes that you've you know, closed out of right here by hitting a reset. I'm not going to do that, but you can. In effects, okay, here's the big one. You can choose to use two effects units or four effects units. I personally like to use four. I like to build big complex effects chains. In a lot of tutorials, though, I'll actually change this over to two effects units just so you can see what's going on more easily. It is a little bit harder to see everything. You know, certainly you're not going to see the full names of the effects and things like that when you have four effects units loaded up. Uh, of course, uh, this is not more than just a visual thing, but you'll be able to choose between single and group effects here.
Okay, in browser details, you're able to change all sorts of things. You can change the font from the tractor font to, let's open up the browser here, change it from the tractor font to, you know, whatever you want. I, I think the tractor font is fine for a lot of things. If you find 12 point too squinty, you can put it all the way up to 16 or all the way down to eight, which I, I personally can't stand. And you can change the height of all these rows. And there's a whole lot of things here that you can choose between. I personally don't mind the cover art there. It minimizes when you switch between a browser view and your mix view. Uh, you also have the ability to show playlist favorites. So you can hide this thing if you don't want that. Track info, I like to have. And then uh, these, the status bar is pretty useful. I would recommend seeing it. If you're trying to load something up, it'll give you a warning down there that something isn't working. Now the layout manager is probably the biggest one here. I typically have two. I have the one that I use when I'm playing out, and I have the one that I use for tutorials for you guys. The difference between them is that one of them shows closer to nothing. This is my what I actually use when I'm DJing, sort of my mixed scratch view. And one of them shows closer to everything. This is for like a tutorial where if I was changing all sorts of things on my mixer and everything, you'd be able to see the feedback up here just so, uh, you know, for sort of educational purposes. You can have more and more and more of these. Essentially, you're able to add from all sorts of different pre presets. So we could add up this Tractor Scratch Pro 4 deck preset and, you know, then edit it or rename it or remove it. So the layout manager can actually be very helpful. Now uh, we're getting close to the end here in file management. There's the show consistency check report on startup. I personally don't like this, uh, but if your library is, if you're starting from scratch and you want to make sure that your library is all 100%, this might be a good thing for a newbie to use just so you know that all of your files are ready to play. Under Analyze Options, this is more than just a visual one, but you can set a beat marker as a hot cue or not. This means that if you were to have this on, whenever you would import and analyze any kind of track, it would actually store the beat marker as a cue point. So you can see that we do have a grid marker here in a grid. I'm actually gonna lock that. But uh, it isn't stored as a cue point, which frees up one extra cue point, so we can use all eight cue points. This will let you switch between musical and open key. Open key is sort of like the Camelot system from harmonicamixing.com. And I, I use the musical keys for, throughout. Musical keys are just more useful. Uh, essentially, while open key, I, you know, I have nothing really against it. It's really only used by DJs who use it for harmonic mixing. Uh, if you go to play with like a guitarist or some other musician and you say, we're in key 4M, they're not necessarily not going to know what you're talking about. So musical key is much more useful outside of Tractor. The controller manager um, is not going to have a lot of things that you'll be able to see in the software, certainly in the hardware, and we'll talk about them in future tutorial, but not in the software. In the X1 Mark II panel, if you're using the X1 Mark II, you can have full browser on touch. I like to put, turn this off. I find that uh, too often I open up the browser when I don't want to. But it is there for you if you like that feature. And that should be all of them in terms of uh, Tractor's visual preferences. As one final aside, you're actually able to export all of your settings, including layouts. So. If you like the way that this looks and you want to save it forever, you can choose to export your GUI layout and you can load it back up or on another computer or whatever you need. So you can back up your settings, all of your settings if you wanted to for a rainy day. I hope that this was helpful. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube for all of our tractor tutorials and check us out at tractorshows.com.